Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. Uh, so my name is Bhante Sudasso, and we'll be continuing with part three of our series on the Kagavasana Sutta. Uh, so the plan is to um, get through as much as we can today, and we might be wrapping up tomorrow uh, if we don't get through everything today. Uh, so we'll start by paying homage to the Buddhas. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang tamang sanghang namasami. So, as mentioned, we'll be continuing with the Kagavasana Sutta, Sanghita Nikaya, uh, Chapter 1, Sutta Number 3, uh, which is mm, commonly translated as the Rhinoceros Horn Sutta. Uh, so, over the past a mm, couple of sessions on the sutta, we've gone through the first 52 verses, which is actually pretty remarkable. I hadn't realized how far we'd gotten um, in the sutta. Uh, and uh, so we'll be continuing on with the sutta. And as I've been doing in the past, I'll read the verses in Pali uh, and then translate word by word and, and explain a bit about the underlying meaning here. Uh, and of course, you're always welcome to type in questions at any time, and I'll do my best to answer your questions uh, at the end. So starting on with verse 53, verse 53 says, Nagova yutani vivajja yitva sanjata kanto parumi ularo yatabi rantang viharang aranye eko chare kagavasana kapo. Uh, so here the Buddha is, uh, again, using the, the image of a, uh, the Pali word is Naga. Uh, so the word Naga, commonly it has three different meanings that it's used for, uh, actually four meanings. So the meaning which we most normally think of when we hear the word Naga is a, a dragon, a dragon spirit. So these uh, very powerful uh, beings, uh, which are, uh, although technically classified as animals in the Buddhist cosmology, they're um, highly intelligent, uh, capable of speech, um, possessing various extraordinary and super mundane abilities and so on. So, for example, in the Vinaya Pitika, there's the, the lovely story of a, a Naga, a, a dragon spirit, uh, who takes the form of a human, uh, so can transform its body into the appearance of a human, um, and mm, tries to get bhikkhu ordination, so ordained as a Buddhist monk. Uh, and when the Buddha found out about this, he was uh, he told the, the Naga, sorry, it's, it's only for humans. Um, but the Buddha recommended some other practices that the Naga could do uh, in order to make progress on the path. So that's that's one thing we commonly think of as Nagas uh, as being dragon spirits. Uh, so these powerful uh, celestial beings. Uh, another common usage of the word Naga is to mean a snake, particularly very large snakes. Um, and this usage is, is less common, but it is uh, occasionally found in the suttas. Um, the third usage, which is very common, is, is Naga is also used to mean an elephant, uh, which is most likely the meaning that's, that's being used here in this uh, part of the sutta. And the fourth use of the word Naga is metaphorically to mean any powerful and majestic being. Uh, so the word Naga is often used to refer to Buddhas and Arhats. Um, so similarly, just as a, a dragon or an elephant is, is a very large, very powerful, very majestic being, uh, one that seems to be 
invincible and impossible to uh, disturb or overwhelm. Uh, there's similarly this idea that a, a Buddha or an Arhant is one who, through mastery of their own mind, uh, has become magnificent and powerful. Uh, but in this part of the sutta, the word Naga is most commonly, uh, most uh, readily appears to be used in the common sense of an elephant. So Naga Uva Yutani Vajayatra means uh, like a, an elephant uh, avoiding a herd or leaving behind a herd. Uh, Sanjatikando padumi ularo. So Sanjatikando means uh, it has a, a immense body. Uh, so it has a um, healthy and, and strong body. Uh, padumi ularo. So ulara means uh, refined or sublime or magnificent. And padumi means uh, lotus. So padumi ularo, uh, one way of understanding this would be as sublime and magnificent as a lotus, uh, which I find very interesting because when one thinks of an elephant, one normally is thinking about its mass, its bulk. Uh, one is thinking about how large and, uh, and strong it is. Uh, but the image of a lotus is something delicate and beautiful. Uh, so mm, this is more a poetic point. It doesn't actually have much, much relevance to the Dhamma here, um, except that the Padma, the lotus flower, is commonly used as a symbol for awakening. Uh, so here the Buddha is using imagery which is relevant to mm, forest life, uh, but which also evokes mm, the imagery of awakening. So again, a Naga, which can mean elephant, but also can refer to an Arhant, uh, an awakened being. Uh, and similarly, lotus, which has the ordinary meaning of uh, a flower, but also can be a reference to awakening. And the next line, Yatabirantang Viharangaranye means uh, it lives wherever it wants in the forest. Um, and finally, the Buddha ends with our familiar closing phrase, Eko Chare Kagavasana Kapo. So one should travel alone uh, like a rhinoceros horn. So the Buddha in this line, he's saying, uh, again, like an elephant that leaves behind the herd uh, and lives in the forest wherever it wishes. Uh, in the same way, one should, uh, should go alone uh, like a rhinoceros horn. So this is also pointing to the fact that being alone is, is not necessarily something that one does uh, out of desperation or out of fear or out of depression, uh, but rather the image is of this, uh, again, a large, powerful, healthy, magnificent elephant who lives alone because it chooses to, uh, because that's what, what it likes to do. So the term yatabirantang, abiranta means, literally it means uh, higher enjoyment, uh, what one really likes. Uh, so the, the elephant is living alone because that's what it likes to do. That's, what, that's how it prefers to be. So similarly, uh, in Buddhism, we're cultivating an enjoyment of solitude, an enjoyment of being alone. Uh, so being completely happy by ourselves uh, without needing any other uh, in order to give us solace or to give us encouragement or to give us affirmation uh, or to give us affection or to give us attention. Uh, perfectly happy by ourselves uh, with nobody else around. Then the next verse, Atanatang Sanganika Ratasa Yang Pasaye Samaye Kang Vimuting so I'm just checking the Pali here because the phrasing is actually a little strange. Um, so one of the uh, peculiarities of hmm, Pali poetry is that often very unusual phrasing is used uh, or terms which are, are very uncommon uh, or words are used in, in ways a little bit different from how they're used in prose. 
Uh, so advance warning for all those who get into Pali translation, don't start with poetry. Uh, so often when people start learning Pali, they want to translate things like the Dhammapada and the Suttinapada. Don't start there. Uh, you're just going to get frustrated. Uh, start with, with <laughs> prose suttas. Uh, so simple, short suttas from the Singhuta Nikaya or Nguttara Nikaya. Anyway, side point. So atanatang means uh, impossibility. Uh, sanganika ratasa. So sanganika means... Uh, socializing. Uh, so sanganika means, uh, literally it means coming together with the group. And ratasa, so rata means one who enjoys doing. So sanganika ratasa means for one who likes to socialize, uh, one who likes to hang out with groups. Uh, so atanatang sanganika ratasa means it is impossible for one who likes socializing and hanging out with groups of people. Yang pasaya samaya kang vimuting. So pasaya means to touch, uh, to contact. Samaya uh, kang means momentary uh, or temporary. And vimuting means liberation. So uh, this is, uh, mm, this term temporary liberation is one that we find a few places in the suttas to refer to um, states of deep concentration. Uh, in particular, the jhanas uh, and also the formless attainments, which are beyond the, the four ordinary jhanas, the four physical jhanas. Uh, so it's called temporary liberation because through meditative concentration, one's mind is temporarily free of defilements. Uh, so when one is in jhana, then the, the five hindrances are gone. So one has no interest in ordinary sensory experiences. One has no aversion or negativity towards anything at all. Uh, one is, is not dull or hazy or sleepy. Uh, in fact, uh, jhana is characterized by having extremely sharp and clear mindfulness. Uh, one is also not restless or agitated. Uh, so jhana is, is also characterized by being very peaceful, uh, very tranquil, very serene. And one has no skepticism because one's mind is, is not vacillating. It's not moving around at all. Uh, so one is not engaging in any, any skeptical thought patterns. But all of that is temporary. So when one emerges from concentration, then one's old defilements will tend to start to resurface uh, because one has not yet developed the wisdom to destroy the underlying causes for one's defilements. So the underlying delusions which the defilements are coming from. So this is why states of samadhi are called temporary liberation. Uh, is because for a short period of time, the mind feels like it's free of defilements. Uh, and short period of time can be anywhere from a, a few seconds to a few days, depending upon um, how strong one's samadhi practice is. Um, but here the Buddha is saying that for one who delights in socializing, it is impossible to get even temporary liberation. In other words, the Buddha is saying that if you like to socialize and hang out with other people and always chatting about this and that and always getting wrapped up in the latest gossip and what's going on and who did what with who, and if you're always getting wrapped up in socializing, uh, then you will find it impossible to get deep, stable samadhi. Uh, you might be able to get some shallow concentration for a few minutes every now and then. Uh, but to get into, uh, into jhana, the mind needs to be very peaceful and steady. Uh, and if you spend a lot of time socializing, uh, hanging out with groups of people, and especially if you spend a lot of time chattering about silly things and listening to other people chatter about silly things, well, then that means it's going to be very difficult for you to, to enter jhana. In fact, here the Buddha is saying it's impossible. It just won't happen. And uh, the next line here, Aditya Bandusa Vacho Nisamma. So Aditya Bandu uh, literally means the, the relative of the sun. Uh, 
so Aditya is the the sun in the sky, uh, and and it itself uh, literally means that which is blazing, uh, that which is is radiant, which is uh, shining. Uh, so Aditya Bandhu means the the kinsman of the sun, the relative of the sun, uh, and it's. Uh, commonly used as a title for the Buddha. Actually, not common. It's, it's relatively uncommon. But you find it in a, a few places in the suttas. Uh, and again, mostly in the poetic verses. Uh, so this is indicating how just as the sun brings light uh, and warmth and, and solace to sentient beings, so too does the Buddha. Uh, with the, the light of his wisdom and compassion, he brings uh, clarity and solace to, to all living beings. Uh, and vacho is, is speech or statement. And nisamma means, mm, uh, one meaning of it is uh, considerate or careful. Uh, so it's saying this is the, the considerate speech of, of the Buddha. Uh, so out of compassion for us, this is what the Buddha is saying. Um, so out of compassion for us, the Buddha is pointing out uh, that if we spend a lot of time socializing and hanging out with people, then, then our meditation practice will not go well. Uh, we'll have a very hard time getting deep concentration. So with all of this in mind, uh, the verse ends once again, Eko chure kagavasana kapo. One should go alone like a rhinoceros horn. Um, so as with uh, so much of the sutta, the Buddha is really emphasizing the, the dangers of socializing, the dangers of, of spending a lot of time with other people. Uh, and here he is emphasizing how harmful it is to one's concentration. So uh, if one really wants to make progress in one's Buddhist practice, it's necessary to make substantial life, lifestyle changes, uh, sometimes dramatic lifestyle changes. Uh, and one of these major lifestyle changes is, is again, to greatly reduce the um, socializing, chattering, gossiping, the, the useless speech and unnecessary uh, time spent with, with groups of people. Um, so the Buddha does, uh, of course, also talk about the value of spiritual friendship, the value of having good, wholesome friends who encourage us to develop wholesome traits of mind. Uh, so we do need to recognize that that is a very important part of the path as well. Uh, but when the Buddha is talking about the danger of, of socializing, it's, it's again the, the tendency that we have uh, to yeah, spend a lot of time talking unnecessarily and getting wrapped up in, in each other's business and each other's history and each other's plans. And uh, the mind becomes very agitated and unsteady, unstable. The mind is then always moving around, reliving the conversations, considering what could have been said differently or what was implied but not directly said or what was misspoken or what was intended. Uh, and all of that makes it, it very difficult to concentrate. Then the next verse here, uh, it says, So, ditti visuka. Uh, so, ditti means a, a viewpoint or an opinion. Uh, and visuka has uh, two meanings. Uh, the more familiar meaning for most people comes from the eight precepts, where visuka means a, a show, a performance, uh, like a play, or uh, these days that would include things like movies or TV shows. Uh, but visuka also has the meaning of uh, writhing uh, or twitching. Uh, so... Uh, ditti Vasuka, then it can mean uh, either one whose viewpoints are a performance, uh, which is an interesting possibility, uh, but more likely the meaning here is that it means one whose, whose viewpoints are, are twitching and writhing. Uh, so the mind is, uh, again, always flopping around with different opinions and possibilities and 
uh, viewpoints about the world. Uh, so the tendency towards speculation and proliferation in the mind. That's more likely the intended meaning here. Uh, I do find it interesting to think, what would it mean for someone to have, uh, to be using viewpoints as a performance? Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps someone who presents ideas and opinions, uh, not necessarily as something they believe, but rather as a, a way of influencing other people, a way of controlling the minds of other people. Uh, but anyway, I think the primary meaning here, once again, is um, one who is, is constantly speculating and vacillating and proliferating, generating a lot of unnecessary uh, mental noise. Uh, but the Buddha is giving a, a positive statement here. So upati vatta means one who has, has gone beyond this, uh, one who has escaped from this. Uh, so one who has left behind uh, all of that speculation and proliferation, all that internal writhing of thoughts of like, well, I wonder if it's like this, or I wonder if it's like that, or, or what actually is real, what, what's not real, what's true, what's not true. Well, you just drop all of that uh, and focus on practicing the, the four satipatthana, practicing the, the foundations of mindfulness, uh, cultivating samadhi and, and panya, so concentration and wisdom. Uh, and then all of that internal twitching and writhing will naturally come to an end on its own. As long as we don't fuel it, it will start to fall away. And pato niyamang pati laddamago. Uh, so pato niyamang means one who has attained certainty. Uh, and pati laddamago similarly means one who has gained the path. So all of this indicates that this is talking about a stream enterer. Uh, so someone who has gone beyond wrong view is one way of, of describing a stream enterer. Uh, one who has attained certainty, again, as a way of, of describing a stream enterer, because a stream enterer has the certainty of eventually reaching awakening. Uh, they've made enough progress in their path that they've reached an irreversible turning point, uh, which they, they can never regress from. Patiladamago, again, one who's gained the path. This is another way that one talks about a stream enterer. Uh, so prior to that first major breakthrough of wisdom, uh, then we're always a little bit uncertain uh, what the right way to practice is or the wrong way to practice. Uh, but once one uh, starts to see for oneself what the Buddha was talking about to a deep enough level that one attains stream entry, then one is now certain of the right path of practice. Uh, one now knows the path that leads towards awakening. Uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt, one is completely convinced uh, through direct experience. So, uh, and another aspect of a stream enterer is that they are committed to Buddhist practice. Uh, they're thoroughly committed to following the path because they've recognized that this is uh, the only true, genuine, safe way uh, of reaching the highest happiness. And they have no more doubt or skepticism about the Buddha's teachings uh, because they've confirmed them for themselves. So for all these reasons, we call a stream enterer, one who has gained the path, one who's on the path. And similarly, upanna jnana. So upanna means arisen uh, or come into being. And jnana means knowing, knowledge. So upanna jnana is one who has, uh, in whom knowledge has arisen. So again, this is a reference to a stream enterer. Uh, a stream enterer has within themselves uh, the knowledge of uh, the truth of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and similarly, the next word, ananya neyo, uh, means uh, not guided by another, uh, which once again is uh, yet another mm, characteristic of a stream enterer. So because a stream enterer has directly seen for themselves the truth of the Buddha's teachings, then they no longer rely upon the teachings of other people. They no longer, strictly speaking, no longer need a teacher uh, because the stream enterer has reached a point of, of certainty. Uh, they're beyond, uh, they know exactly how to practice and they don't need anybody else to 
confirm their practice or uh, guide them or instruct them, um, they may still take advantage of the benefits of more experienced practitioners, someone who's farther along the path, but it's not strictly necessary for a stream enterer. So that's why we call them ananya neyo, so one who uh, is not guided by another. So eko tre kagavasana kapo, so one should go alone like a rhinoceros horn. So this is uh, this particular verse here. Uh, again, it's talking about a stream enterer. So this is kind of the ideal. Um, so a stream enterer, since they don't need anybody else to guide them, since they know for sure that they're on the right path, then they, more than anybody else, uh, can safely go about it alone uh, because they know for sure that they're they're practicing correctly. Then the next verse, Nilolupo nikuho nipipaso, nimako nidhanta kasava moho, nirasayo sabaloke bavitva, eko chare kagavasana kapo. So this verse, um, every single word, uh, so the first six words here, they all start with the prefix nir, which means without or free from or, or uh, having put down. So nilolupo means one who has put down greed, uh, one who has put down uh, any kind of uh, hankering or, or craving for things. Uh, Nikkuho, so kuha means deceitfulness or fraudulence. Uh, so they've put down fraudulence. They're not trying to deceive anyone or trick anyone. And they're not trying to trick themselves either. This is another interesting point in our practice. As we start to become more aware of our own mind and our own mental behaviors, we can start to realize uh, how we, we play mind games with ourselves. Uh, how um, often when we um, experience an uncomfortable truth or we start to discover something that we don't really want to admit to ourselves, uh, then we'll just start telling ourselves stories to get around it or to evade it. Uh, or to convince us of, of something other uh, than, than the uncomfortable truth that we don't want to face. So uh, the more one practices, the more honest one becomes with oneself. Uh, the, and the more difficult it is to fool ourselves. Uh, we more clearly see our own experience. And we recognize the tendencies that we have to try to cover up or avoid uncomfortable parts of our experience. Uh, but we recognize that Knowing the truth of things is much more important than, than coddling ourselves. Uh, it's much more important than generating a false sense of comfort. Uh, much better is the comfort of knowing things as they are. So nikuho, so not uh, deceitful, uh, not fraudulent in any way, either with others or with oneself. The next word nipipaso means uh, without thirst. So pipasa means uh, thirst. So this is a, another image that the Buddha uses for craving. And in fact, the word tanha literally means thirst. So pipasa and tanha are synonyms. So nipipasa means uh, without craving, without thirst. Uh, and nimmakko, uh, so makka has the meaning of um, uh, conceit or arrogance. Uh, so uh, it also has the meaning of uh, hypocrisy or uh, depreciation. So the sense of mm, um, criticizing others, but not in a constructive way. Uh, so criticizing and as a way of, of attacking or tearing somebody down. Uh, which again doesn't necessarily mean other people it's also something that we do to ourselves uh, so uh, many people have a problem with uh, low self-esteem and, and constantly attacking themselves for their their perceived shortcomings uh, which does need to be clearly distinguished from uh, on the other hand evaluating where we need to improve our practice so asking ourselves, so what am I, what am I not doing so well on that I could work on improving? 
Um, so there the goal is to become better. Uh, but often the goal in, in depreciating oneself is, is more just a form of, of self-attack, a form of a self-harm rather than anything that leads to genuine benefit. So nimmako, again, it has this range of meaning. So first about not uh, attacking uh, anyone. So not mm, harshly criticizing anyone. Uh, but it also has the meaning of, of not getting caught up in uh, arrogance or, again, this, this kind of self-obsession, this hostile self-obsessiveness. And the next word, nidantika sava moho, means uh, one who has discarded the stain of delusion. Uh, so this is, uh, again, kind of the ideal that we're aiming for. Uh, is to examine our mind and, and look for uh, delusion. Uh, and delusion is, is one of the most difficult things to isolate and eliminate from the mind uh, because we tend to really firmly believe our own delusions. Otherwise, they wouldn't be delusions. Uh, so often the way that we get rid of delusion is through the help of others. Uh, one of the best ways to get rid of delusions is to live in a monastic community for a few years. Because trust me, everybody around you knows what your delusions are. And if you're lucky, they will tell you. And if you're mm, committed to the training, then you will be very happy that they're telling you and you'll see what you can do to rectify your own mind. It's much more difficult to overcome delusion when you're on your own. Uh, so this also is why uh, in our practice, we do have uh, these two parallel recommendations from the Buddha. Uh, so one is the recommendation that we find all throughout the sutta, which is to, uh, to be alone. And then it's better to be alone than to be with fools. Uh, but we also have the recommendation that we find throughout many other suttas and, and also briefly in this one that it's very valuable to have good spiritual friends who can support us and offer us direction and encouragement. And the next word, niraseyo. Uh, so this means independent, uh, not, not relying upon anyone or anything. Uh, uh, so niraseyo sabaloke bhavitra, uh, means, uh, again, in, in the whole world, one is independent. Uh, one doesn't rely upon anything at all, anywhere in the world. Uh, so this is a mind which is completely content under any circumstances. So it's not a mind which is like, well, wherever I go, there must be Thai food. If there's no Thai food, I just can't live there. That would just be awful. Uh, so that's not a mind which is independent. That's a mind which, which is dependent, which relies on something. Or like, well, I can only live in, in warm climates. Well, that limits your options a bit. Fortunately, that includes several Buddhist countries. Um, so you still have some good choices. Uh, or if you think, well, I can only live with a certain kind of person or I can only live under a certain kind of building or like whenever you create conditions, uh, then you're limiting your ability to be happy. So nirasaya, not depending upon anything, means that we're cultivating unconditional happiness. Uh, a mind which does not rely upon any particular condition or circumstance. So then the Buddha is saying, if you have all of these qualities, then you can travel alone. You can live alone. Uh, you have nothing to worry about in, in solitude. Uh, then the next verse, the Buddha says, Papang sahayang parivajayeta, Anatta dasing vasame nivetang, sayang naseve pasutang pamatang, eko chare kagavasana kapo. So papang sahayang means evil companions, harmful companions. Parivajayeta means avoid, completely avoid. So pari means completely, and vajaya means to avoid. So he's saying you should completely avoid uh, harmful friends. Uh, so people who are, are bad influences or, or who have unwholesome habits, you should just completely avoid people like that. 
Um, and uh, so he says such people are anatta dusting, uh, which means they are fixated on unbeneficial things. And visame nivitang means they're they're settled in the uh, visama has the literal meaning of uneven ground. Uh, so the sense of rough or difficult or dangerous terrain. Uh, and in the suttas, it's commonly used to mean uh, unwholesome conduct of body, speech, and mind. Uh, so when you're traveling, you want to travel on smooth, level, even roads. When you're farming, you want to farm on smooth, level, even ground. Uh, when you're building, you want to build on smooth, level, even ground. Nobody wants rough, unstable, uh, unsteady terrain. Uh, nobody wants the, the bad ground. Uh, so similarly, if one is, is caught up in greed, hatred, and delusion, then that's like being caught up in, in rough terrain. Uh, there's not, uh, it's very difficult to do anything beneficial under those conditions. So visima is sometimes translated as unrighteous. Um, which I find highly amusing um, and captures a little bit of the meaning, um, but uh, has a very different flavor. Uh, so the word visima, again, literally means uneven. Um, but translating it as, as unrighteous is interesting. Uh, visima, by the way, another meaning of it is uh, unharmonious. So sama can also mean harmony. Uh, so like in the sense of when, when people are chanting together, we try to chant in harmony, we try to harmonize. So visama is, is when you're out of harmony. So similarly, when one is caught up in unwholesome behavior of body, speech, and mind, then one is out of harmony with reality. You know, one is out of harmony with the wisdom of the Buddhas. Uh, so that has a similar feeling of the, the discordant feeling that one gets when one is chanting out of tune with other people, uh, out of out of sync with other people. And then the Buddha, the Buddha next says, Sayang Naseve Pasutang Pamatang. So one should not oneself uh, engage in uh, such uh, negligence. Uh, and ekotre kagavasana kapo, one should travel alone like a rhinoceros horn. Um, so here, uh, the Buddha, again, he's really emphasizing the danger of harmful friends, uh, the danger of, of spending time with companions who are caught up in unbeneficial, uh, discordant ways of, of um, acting, speaking, and thinking. Uh, he's saying that we don't want to spend time with them because we can get wrapped up in the same negligent behavior that they do. So it's, it's better to leave them behind and, and go alone. And then the next line, the Buddha says something uh, which is giving a, a different perspective. So he says, Bahusutang dhamma darang bajeta, mitang ularang patiban avantang, anyaya atani vaneya kankang, eko chare kagavasana kapo. So bahusu tang means one who uh, knows much, one who has heard much. And in the suttas, this is normally defined as one who has learned much of the suttas. So bahusu tang means one who knows a lot of the Buddha's teachings, who's heard a lot of the, the scriptures. In modern terms, this would be someone who has read through all the suttas, for example, uh, which if you haven't started reading through all the suttas, you should start reading through all the suttas. So bahusu tang, one who knows much of the Buddha's teachings. Dhamma darang. Uh, so Dhamma dara means one who is a holder of the Dhamma. Uh, so one who remembers the Dhamma, one who holds the Dhamma in mind, uh, and one who upholds the Dhamma in the sense that they live it and practice it. Uh, and bhajeta means to associate with and, and spend time with. So the Buddha is saying you should spend time with people who know a lot of the suttas uh, and who hold the Dhamma in mind. Uh, so again, this is a, a different statement. Again, the Buddha keeps saying it's better to be alone than to be with fools. And he keeps praising solitude. But every now and then he throws in little reminders that it's also 
very important to have good friends, supportive friends. So uh, he says, uh, again, to hang out with people who know a lot of the suttas, who uphold the Dhamma. Uh, and he says, such a friend is uh, sublime. Uh, and uh, so patibana vantang. So patibana has the meaning of uh, both of uh, eloquence and of inspiration. Uh, so to spend time with friends who are, mm, again, very knowledgeable about the suttas and who are mm, eloquent uh, and inspirational. Uh, so anyaya uh, atani vinaya kankang uh, means, uh, so having known uh, what is benefit, what is beneficial, one removes doubt. So here the Buddha is pointing to the fact that when one associates with mm, good friends who know a lot about the suttas and who are always thinking about the Dhamma and following the Dhamma, uh, then you can learn a lot from those people. You can learn a lot about what's really beneficial. Uh, and they can also help you to remove your doubts. Uh, you can ask them questions about the Dhamma. You can ask them questions about how to practice the Eightfold Path. You can ask them questions about their own practice and what's worked for them. Uh, you can describe your own practice and ask them for advice. So that can help to clear away your, your doubts and uncertainties about the right way to practice. Uh, so it's very beneficial and useful uh, to have good friends of that sort. And then once you've learned enough from those, those wise people, those learned people, once you've learned enough to clear away all your doubts so that you're certain you're practicing correctly, then the Buddha says, Eko chure kagavasana kapo. Uh, then you can travel uh, alone. You can go alone. Then the, the next line here, uh, says kiddang rating kama sukancha loke analankaritva anape kamano vibhusana tana virato sachavadi eko chare kagavasana kapo. So here the Buddha is, uh, uh, he starts off by, by saying, so kiddang rating kama sukancha loke. So in the world, there's a lot of, of, uh, entertainment uh, and sensual pleasures. Um, so I actually really love this where every now and then in the suttas, the Buddha, uh, he's, he's kind of keeping it real and he's just like, yeah, there actually are some really pleasant things you can do in, in this life. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but anyone who's been a lay person for any length of time, uh, which is most people, uh, you know that there's lots of pleasant things that you can do uh, in this life. Uh, and in fact, it's our, our tendency to get obsessed with such things that keeps us trapped in samsara. Uh, because uh, even when one is, is well embarked on the Buddhist path, there's usually two parts to our mind. There's the part which really wants to practice the Dhamma well, uh, and which sees the benefit and value and, and happiness of the Dhamma. And the other part of our mind, which is like, yeah, but uh, movies are really fun too. And uh, ice cream, you can have it any time. And, and, and those people are really cute. And, and then I really like this musician. And, and so we start uh, getting lost in the, in the things of the world. Uh, so it's very easy to get wrapped up in the pleasant things of the world. Uh, and to forget the, the sublime happiness of the Dhamma. Uh, or never to seek it out in the first place. So the Buddha is like, yeah, there, there are lots of nice entertainments and pleasant things in the world. Uh, and he says, uh, one should not be obsessed with such things. One should not look for such things. Uh, one should not seek out such things. Uh, so he's saying, yeah, these, these things do exist, um, but they are unsatisfying. Uh, so one sets them aside and, and doesn't seek for them. So the word uh, alankaritva uh, literally means it's uh, able to be enough. So analankaritva, so recognizing that these things are, are not sufficient, they're not satisfying, they're not able to be enough for us. Uh, 
so you can never get enough of sensual pleasure. You can never get enough entertainment. Uh, so even if you get through uh, an entire season of some show, well, there's another season. And even if you get through all the seasons ever released of that show, well, uh, turns out there's a dozen more shows which are similar, which you will probably also like. Uh, so there's never any end uh, to entertainment. And no matter how much you keep pursuing it, it's always unsatisfying. Uh, so the Buddha is recommending that we recognize the futility of, of it right from the beginning uh, and to instead pursue a, a higher happiness. So, uh, and he also says, Vibhusanatana virato. So Vibhusanatana means beautification. Uh, so Vibhusana means uh, ornaments or adornments. Uh, so Vibhusanatana means anything that we use to uh, beautify our bodies. Uh, so commonly it's used to refer to jewelry, um, but it can also refer to cosmetics. It can refer to fancy clothing. It can refer to how you do your hair and so on. So all of that is just pointless vanity. Uh, it doesn't actually bring us anywhere closer to wisdom. and It doesn't bring us any real benefit. Um, so the Buddha encourages us to refrain from such things. Um, and uh, so uh, this is all referring to one of the eight precepts. So when one is staying in a monastery or if one is interested in practicing very diligently as a lay person, then one of the eight precepts is the commitment to avoid entertainment and to avoid any kind of self-beautification. Um, and finally, he says such a body, so speaking the truth. Uh, so truthfulness is, is a very important part of our practice being truthful with others and being truthful with ourselves. Uh, because uh, Buddhist practice is all about discovering the truth of the way things are. Uh, so we want to value and uphold truth. And then the next verse uh, says, put tancha darang pitarancha matarang danani danyani chabandavani hitvana kamani yato dikani eko chare kagavasana kapo. So this says, um, uh, children, spouse, mother, uh, father and mother, uh, wealth, grain, and relatives, uh, having left them behind. Um, As mentioned, every now and then in Pali poetry, one comes across a, a very unusual word. Um, so give me just a moment as I, I look into this one. So according to Bhikkhu Bodhi, this means uh, to the limit, uh, which still doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, or according to the, uh, the relevant conditions. Let's see, so it's from the word OD, which means boundary or limit. So yeah, yatodika would mean uh, based on the limit or to, to the extent possible. Okay, so here we go. Hitvana kamani yatodikani means having abandoned sensuality to the extent possible. So this also is a, an important distinction here. So the Buddha, for example, talks about how uh, one cannot avoid food. Uh, food is necessary in order to stay alive. So we don't avoid food, uh, but rather we use it appropriately. We use food in a way that nourishes our, our physical health and helps to sustain our, our spiritual practice. Uh, but we mm, avoid getting obsessed with having any particular kind of pleasant food or requiring anything in, in specific, uh, but rather recognizing that, again, food is necessary for our life, but we want to be careful not to use it in a way that fuels our attachment to sensuality. Uh, so if you try to discard the sensuality of, of food altogether, well, your body will die in a few days or a few weeks, and that will be the end of that. And that's, that's actually not Buddhism. 
On the other hand, the Buddha does say that for one who is sincerely focused on attaining awakening as quickly as possible, uh, sexuality is to be discarded entirely. Uh, so there's no limit to that one. That one is, is to be completely cut out. Uh, so there's a, a lovely sutta on this. It's one of the suttas with Venerable Ananda, where Venerable Ananda is talking about four things. Uh, so he talks about how uh, food is something which is mm, not to be eliminated, but it's to be used appropriately. Uh, I think robes are something to be used uh, appropriately, and uh, but not to be removed. And, and then a third one, which I don't remember. And then the fourth one, he says, but for sexuality, you should just get rid of it entirely. Now, actually, the, the term he uses is he says, uh, one should burn the bridge. Uh, he says, with sexuality, you should burn your bridges. Uh, so that one, you need to recognize that that one's completely not an option anymore. Um, I, I don't remember the the specific sutta. I need to look it up again one of these days. Um, anyway, so the again, the Buddha here is saying that one should be willing to leave behind uh, all of your relatives, all of your wealth. Uh, and you should be able, you should be willing to leave behind uh, sensory pleasure to the extent possible. You know, so recognizing that there is a limit to how much one can discard of sensory experience, because to some degree, as long as your body is alive, it will require a certain amount of sensory experience, a certain amount of sensory stimulation just to survive. Uh, but we discard anything unnecessary. Uh, and then the Buddha says again, Eko chare kagavasana kapo. Uh, one should go alone, like a rhinoceros horn. Then the next verse here says, Sango eso par parita meta so kyang, apasado dukameta biyo, galo eso iti nyatra motima, eko chare kagavasana kapo. So uh, this one, Sango Eso Puritameta Sokyang, he says, attachment here has little pleasure. Apasado uh, means uh, the gratification is minimal, uh, very small. Dukameta Biyo means the, the dukkha is greater. So this is a, a statement we see in, in several places in the suttas where the Buddha he says, yeah, there is gratification, there is pleasure in sensory experiences. Uh, but the pleasure is minimal uh, and the drawback is greater. Uh, so the dukkha that comes through desire and attachment for sensory experiences is greater than the pleasure we get from those experiences. And this is something to be recognized in, in one's own mind. And galo eso iti nyatva motima uh, means one should know this as uh, being like cancer. So the desire for sensuality is like cancer. Eko chare kagavasana kapo means that one should go alone like rhinoceros horn. Then the next line, uh, so we'll do just a, a couple more and then I'll, I'll take questions. I see there's a few questions, um, so I'll take those in just a few minutes. Sandailayetvana sangyojanani jalang vabetva salilam buchari agiva daddang anivattamano ekochare kagavasana kapo. So sandailayetvana sangyojanani means having broken the fetters. Uh, so having uh, cut the fetters. So the, the fetters here, uh, Sanyojana, usually refers to the 10 mm, obstructions to awakening. Uh, so the first three are cut through when one becomes a, a stream enterer, the first stage of awakening. Um, then the first five, when one reaches the third stage of awakening, and all 10 when one uh, reaches full awakening. So having uh, cut the fetters, broken the fetters, Jalangvabetva uh, means having uh, like having broken a net, Salilam Buchari. Ah, like a fish that has broken a net. Uh, so this this is a, a lovely metaphor he's giving. It's like a fish that's caught in a net that breaks free of it and goes free. 
Um, in the same way, we're caught in the net of our own delusions, uh, of our own defilements and delusions. So to break the fetters is like the fish breaking free of the net. Uh, so it can happily go free. Um, uh, so this means uh, like something irreversibly destroyed by fire. Uh, so this is another image he's using here is that uh, when, as one begins to make progress on the path, uh, in the beginning, what we're doing is we're, we're usually doing uh, two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes one step forward, two steps back. Uh, so uh, we make some progress, but then we get distracted and confused and, and we lose the progress we've made and we try again and we get, and we make more mistakes. And so we're always like going forward and backward. So we're, we're never uh, making permanent progress. It's always temporary progress. Uh, but when one becomes a stream mentor, this is where one has finally made irreversible progress. One has, uh, rather than just temporarily weakening uh, certain parts of our delusions, our massive delusion, uh, one has completely eradicated them. One has incinerated them. So the imagery that Buddha is using here is something that's been irreversibly incinerated, completely destroyed by fire. So similarly, when one becomes a stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhant, at each of these four stages, uh, one is completely incinerating uh, the fetters, so destroying them entirely uh, with no possibility for them to reappear. Uh, and it ends with Eko Chere Kagavasana Kapo again. Um, then the next line, Okita Chaku Nacha Pada Lolo Gutindrio Rakita Mana Sasano Anavasuto Aparidaya Mano Eko Chere Kagavasana Kapo. Okitachaku means with one's eyes cast down. So this means not, not looking all over the place. Uh, so nachapada uh, lolo again means like you're uh, greedily looking everywhere. Uh, literally means with, with greedy feet. Uh, so normally we, uh, uh, when we're walking around, like maybe you're walking through a city, it's always looking around at all the interesting things. Uh, but one of our monastic rules actually is uh, called uh, oke techaku. So when we're going mm, around in towns and cities, the Buddha says we should try to keep our eyes pointed down uh, so that we can stay mindful and not get distracted uh, by all the interesting things to see. Uh, so to try to keep our senses restrained uh, so that we don't get uh, footloose. So pada lolo could be translated footloose. Uh, your, your feet are, are wanton, your feet are uncontrolled. Uh, so we should be oke chaku, so with our, our eyes restrained. Nacha pada lolo, we should not be footloose. Uh, and gutindrio means with our, our sense faculties guarded. Rakita mana sasano means, uh, again, with the mind uh, well guarded. Uh, so uh, these are both references to sense restraint, which is the, the practice of not fixating uh, on pleasant or unpleasant things within our sensory field, uh, but instead keeping uh, our gaze uh, un, uh, undistracted, uh, not getting caught by sensory, by reaction to sensory stimuli. And anavasuto means uninfluenced, so not uh, not affected by one's uh, by any defilements, not influenced by any defilements. Uh, so it's related to the word asava. So anavasuto, not influenced. And aparidaihamano means uh, not being burned. So pari means completely and daiha means to be burned. So normally we're being burned from the inside out by our own defilements, by our own desires and aversion. So one who is a paridaihamano is one who is not being burned from the inside out. Uh, one whose mind is, is cool and peaceful on the inside uh, rather than, than burning us up from the inside out. 
Echo tree kagavasana kapo. One should go alone like a rhinoceros horn. So I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause at this point. So we've been going for about an hour. Uh, so I'll stop at this point and take any questions that you might have. Uh, so we can start by uh, respecting the sutta with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the, the chat window and I'll answer them as best I can. Uh, so hello to all the people joining in. So hello to John, Vidura, Vivian, Tora, Mary, Yankee, Amaranta, uh, Monica. Oh from uh, Italy, uh, Bella, Sud, um, uh, a handful of people with names in scripts I can't read. So someone in Thai script, so hello to whoever you are. Someone in Burmese script, hello to you as well. Uh, and Bhante Sumitta, who's somewhere else in the monastery <laughs> and <laughs> watching the live stream remotely. So hello, Bhante, good to see you. Uh, and hello to Patricia, Bhavani, Miguel, uh, someone in Tibetan script. Um, hello to Winalin, Hoa, Anonymous, and Nilsa. Wow, many people, wonderful. Um, and we have some questions. Bhavani asks, can the meeting of Patibana be talented? I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, so Patibana um, comes from the verb banati, which means to speak. Uh, to, uh, and it, it particularly has the meaning of to speak eloquently or clearly or well. Um, but it, its basic meaning is just to speak. So patibana means, most literally, it means eloquent. Um, but it's used in many places in the suttas, uh, and it's um, commonly an adjective for arhants, though occasionally it's used for people who are not arhants, but who are particularly, well, eloquent. Um, and it's sometimes also used to mean uh, like a spontaneous inspiration. Um, like uh, what comes to mind is there's some places in the suttas where a poet uh, talks about like, oh, I've had this patibana. And the Buddha is like, okay, okay, share it. And the person gives this, this spontaneous poem that, that appeared in their mind. It's like the Buddha will be giving a Dhamma talk and someone will have this, this patibana, this kind of like eloquent inspiration uh, appear in their mind and then they'll share it. So it's, it's also used in that sense of, of meaning uh, this kind of like spontaneous inspiration. Um, but the, the literal meaning is simply eloquence. Uh, and it's interesting that this is connected with awakening, uh, that the development of wisdom is also connected with an ability to eloquently convey uh, that wisdom. And Bhavani also asks, uh, Yadodikang means as it is. No, that's not correct. You're thinking, of, you're probably thinking of Yatabuta. So uh, it both starts from Yata. So the, the word Yata means as it is. Uh, so Yatabuta, uh, Buta means become uh, or fact or actual. So Yatabuta means according to fact or as things are. So yatabuta means uh, accurately or as it really is. So yatodikang uh, is from yata, which again means um, as it is or according, and odika, which means the, the boundary or limit. So yatodikang, uh, as far as I can tell, means um, to the extent possible or, or to the, the limit, uh, as much as one is able. Then Anonymous asks, what is the difference between observing and thinking? They are not even remotely the same thing. Uh, so when you're observing something, 
Uh, you're feeling it directly. Uh, whereas to think about something is to generate an internal mental activity. So usually a verbal thinking, a verbal thought pattern about something. So for example, observing uh, is, mm, uh, say you take a bite of food and you're just focusing on, on tasting it, on being present with the taste, or you have a sip of tea. You're just focusing on the, the experience of, of the, tasting the tea. But then you start thinking, oh, well, the tea, it's, it's hot. Uh, it's got a, a floral aroma to it. Uh, it. Reminds me of that tea my grandmother used to make. That's all in the domain of thinking. <clears throat> so observing is just to directly feel the experience. Whereas thinking is generating uh, usually verbal mental activity related to, perhaps related to that experience. Sud says, uh, very nice sutta, should one not practice alone until one is a stream enterer? That's certainly the safest option. Uh, though, remember the Buddha also said that if you can't find wise companions, then it's better to be alone. Uh, but yeah, if one is not yet a stream enterer, then it's very important to have good, wise companions and teachers uh, who can help one uh, to stay focused on the path and to keep making progress. Once one is a stream enterer, then you can do whatever you want because you're so fixated on Dhamma at that point that it doesn't matter whether you're alone or, or with good people or bad people, you'll keep making progress. Um, and Sud clarifies, is it dangerous to practice alone until one becomes a stream enterer? Um, again, if you are able to find good, wise, wholesome spiritual companions and teachers, then you want to associate with those people. You don't necessarily need to spend every minute with them, but you want to have some kind of ongoing connection with them. So even if someone's not a stream enterer, uh, if they know how to practice well, they might spend most of their time practicing alone but they should still have some kind of ongoing contact with teachers and, and companions. Uh, it doesn't need to be all the time, but once in a while, because that's a, a balancing point that helps to keep us from getting off track. Bhavani asks, I have a habit of collecting Buddha figurines. Is this okay? That's a little off topic. I think that's more of a monk chat question. It's a good question though. So I recommend bringing that to monk chat tomorrow evening. And we'll talk about it then. And Anonymous says, so observing is better than thinking? I'm um, generally speaking, if you have to pick between one or the other, I would go with observing uh, because observing is closer to a direct experience of reality. So it's closer to truth. Uh, but there is actually a place for thinking. Uh, so in the sense of analyzing one's experience, you can use your mind's capacity for um, analyzing and verbalizing to help you get to a deeper understanding of an experience. Uh, but that needs to be grounded in direct observation. And the act of direct observation should be as unfiltered, unaltered, and clear as possible. Uh, then when you think about the experience afterwards, then you'll actually be going off accurate data. Um, so you'll, you'll come to better conclusions. And Vidura says about gossiping, how to be at work when people are gossiping. Try to stay away from people when they're gossiping. That would be my first recommendation. Second, if you're around people who are gossiping, um, don't participate. Uh, and third, try to look for ways to gently steer the conversation in a more wholesome direction. Uh, and this is not always easy, uh, but do the best you can. And that's the last question. Uh, so is there anything from the monastery residents? No? Okay, so we can go ahead and, and end at this point. 
Um, so again, if you have any other questions, you can bring them uh, to the final session of the sutta, which we'll do tomorrow morning. And then any off topic questions you can bring to monk chat tomorrow evening. So we'll go ahead and end at this time with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu.